Good morning, everybody. It's Saturday morning here, and my wife uh, made a suggestion last night after I showed her this uh, this uh, particular meme that was sent to me by Ben Rand. Uh, and uh, she says, you might as well just go ahead and make a video in the morning. I said, all right, let's get up and we'll, we'll get this going. So let's talk a bit about the weather because we've got to watch it very closely over the weekend just to see how these transitions happen, given how volatile the market's been responding to the weather. So let's go have a look at it. First thing I want to show you, like I normally do, is just the satellite data. It's, sun's rising here, a lot of haze in the sky still from some of the smoke from the wildfires across parts of Canada. But I'm going to take you back again just to yesterday. It's just every day we see, whoops, sorry, I got a new update there. We just see these very large complexes of storms that have been rolling out of parts of Colorado. They've been through the plains. We've continued just to hammer parts of Texas and this quadrant kind of right in through here with just a lot of severe weather. And each, each complex of storms brings in a new threat, including large hail, straight line wind and, and tornado damage. And again, yesterday was no exception to that. We look at just the last three days worth of rainfall through 5 a.m. this morning here, and uh, we, we start to just see the incredibly uh, heavy rain that's been in parts of the southeast. But this is not to ignore the flooding that has gone on here in parts of Colorado, for example, or getting up into Wyoming, uh, where some of the storms have put down just a continued heavy rainfall. And so we're going to ask, you know, is this corridor going to continue to stay open? And the near-term answer is yes. But uh, as we started to, to just discuss in the last week, there are some things that are kind of systematically changing in the pattern. And like I've said, one of the key components of that is the heat that's building into parts of Texas. Uh, but one thing I want to do real quick, why don't we take this and knock off the lowest masked. There we go. That'll knock off the lowest um, half inch, and now you start to see where the really, really heavy stuff was. So great rains for New England, much needed. This, of course, was from that super that went right here through parts of Ohio, and uh, we're just seeing here again some of the very heavy rain. Storm reports, these are the latest reports from yesterday. We added another 372 reports of severe weather, including the severe weather that went through parts of uh, North Carolina, Virginia. We were watching the tail end of the storms come through here, and there was... A lot of hail in this, same thing with the storms down south and um, a lot of straight line wind damage. So the issue is that this ridge that's building into southern Texas, uh, one of the things I've noticed is it's expanded a bit and it's moved a bit farther to the west into Mexico. So the shortwaves that come around the top edge of it, I'm talking about these right here, what they end up doing here is they're going to kind of run the periphery of the ridge. They're going to build storms that are going to cascade farther and farther to the south like this. That's just how these storms were built. But we're going to watch to see how these, this particular shortwave makes its way into Missouri and Illinois. That's going to be the key area I'm going to be keeping an eye out on from this particular wave right here. The low is going to be exiting parts of New England today. We still have a deeper trough coming into the Pacific Northwest. So a lot of the things we discussed this week are still in play. But in terms of the severe weather, the Storm Prediction Center has now got another large area of enhanced risk today coming out of Colorado, but going right through the heart of Oklahoma and just following that same path around the ridge all the way down into Florida. And that continues tomorrow. Got an enhanced risk already issued tomorrow for the lower Mississippi River Valley. We get into the day here on the 19th, and it's still down here uh, over much uh, of the southeast. So there's three more days of dealing with this, just progressing east with time. The high-resolution models have got a good handle on this. I mean, they're at least identifying the convection. But what I want you to watch here is the system that's, remember that little shortwave I talked about? I want you to watch how that's going to progress through Missouri and eventually make its way over here to southern Illinois. Now, we've been watching this all week, and we've seen the models pull back on its position, but I think now the high-res models are picking up on it because the wave is already over the mountains. So we're going to have our best possible simulation of it. So going through Saturday, this is through Saturday night. Again, this is the corridor in through which we're going to watch for the severe storms. Big straight line wind threat here, also hail and isolated tornadoes. And then we see that wave pressing through Missouri, Arkansas, right down here across the Mississippi River, while storms are coming out of uh, Florida, while another low is cutting into the Pacific Northwest. You can see the rainfall coming through here. And then we're going to see this low curl up almost over St. Louis, from Columbia to St. Louis here. This is on Sunday afternoon getting into the evening hours. And it's possibly going to spread some rain into Iowa could produce some storms into Iowa. I mean, you can start to see the low curling up and the storms just to the north of it here. And then out of Missouri into southern Illinois, possibly hitting western Illinois. This is, um, you know, compared to historical averages, this is one of the driest places in North America. In fact, across the, the planet right now compared to normal. Uh, so this is an area that desperately needs to get this rainfall. Because what's after this system is a big ridge that builds in, and a ridge is going to be oriented just like this. And unfortunately, that's going to deliver 90-degree heat and above 90-degree heat later this week for this part of the Corn Belt. 
So these rains sliding through here by 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday are going to be critical. I can add it up for you real fast from the high res NAM. Now remember, this is just a single model run. We played this out there, and that's what we see in terms of total rainfall. I want nothing more for this, you know, for than this to happen. This has got to come through here. This system has to outperform expectations uh, for these regions that could possibly get some precipitation. Uh, this whole area needs this, all right? Now, bigger picture things. This is what the jet stream is up to. So that's the wave we're watching, you know? And you can see that it goes right now over Missouri, sets up almost perfectly over St. Louis, and then moves into the Tennessee and Ohio Valley. Uh, so the thing about this is, is that earlier in the week, that low had gone farther to the south quicker. So now the little bit of northward shift is what's given us this positive outlook. But do you see what's coming in behind it? Stretching from the Texas Ridge all the way here to the Hudson Bay. This is the region through which we're going to watch that saddle point develop. We're going to watch the, the dryness come in and the heat come in following this. So this is Tuesday, really Monday night. This is what the pattern will show. The ridge opens up here on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Much deeper trough comes in the west. Much cooler weather comes in the west. And this low likely cuts itself off. So with the trough here and a trough sitting over here, what we end up getting is that, that kind of omega look to the pattern again. So those blocking patterns are no good. Now why I wouldn't call this an omega block is, by definition, a block has to last 10 days. And this one appears to break down. When is it breaking down? Out there, no longer at day 10 or, or day 12, but day 7. And what we see out here is that by the 24th and 25th, this ridge making its way over to, um, you know, parts of, uh, i got to draw that correctly, that ridge making its way, hang on a second, Eric, I know it's early on Saturday, there we go. That ridge making its way over here to this part of, of Mexico seems to be enhancing the subtropical jet like we talked about this week. And this ridge seems to be losing some of its, its kind of uh, amplitude. And with the tr small trough still sitting here, there is a chance that we do increase rainfall going into the following weekend. This is like the 24th, 25th, 26th. And this is kind of the new thing that showed up in the models. That's a trough that came out of the northern plains and is sliding through the Midwest. Now, the point behind me telling you this is that storms that will initiate here will follow this system into this region. And we're out there at that critical date I keep talking about, the 21st through the 25th. This feature is the most important feature for the Corn Belt so far this year. And could it be the beginning of what we hope to be some new kind of view here to the pattern to finish the month of June? The farther this ridge goes back to the west, see it there? The farther it goes back to the west, the more the chances of cascading storms into this area become as we go forward. And I talk about that area so much because that is the area that has been the driest over the last 30. In fact, it's the driest. We're starting week six of this flash drought. It's no longer a flash drought. It's becoming a hydrologic drought, of course, in this area. Now, that is not to ignore the dryness that's down here in the lower Mississippi Valley or what's going on in the mid-Atlantic into New England or how incredibly dry it's been along the uh, I-5 corridor here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. It's just to identify that this is an area I know I have a lot of concerned growers that are contacting me daily, so I just think about it a lot. The stats, just wanted to point out again how critical those rains are going to be for Western Illinois if they materialize late this weekend, because this is an area, I mean, even a half inch doesn't matter anything to kind of offset the, the, the record that's being set here. But this is not to take away from what's going on in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Indiana, or then even though Iowa got good, or Ohio, excuse me, got good rains last weekend, we're still in long-term deficit. Or take just a look at the deficit still remaining here in uh, New England after um, even after good rains uh, we, we just saw through this area. So we're flooding here. We continue to stay very dry there. And we're seeing if this pattern can break away from this to deliver this moisture. So here it is. This is the newest WPC update. But the only thing I can share with you that's changed is this line, this boundary of where the wetter weather is going to be, has moved east. And the storms in this area are now producing more precipitation than anticipated. Our wettest area, of course, is down here where the storms continue to cascade and where it's been storming heavily for the last week. But this is the area that I'm going to be watching for week two to begin to fill in with this upcoming pattern. By the way, take a look at how wet it's going to be coming out of British Columbia and Alberta here. This is right where those fires had been. So a couple of model updates. This is the ECMWF. Let's just play it forward and look. 
Here we are going into next Wednesday, Thursday. Getting out there to Friday, we're going to pause this at 168 hours. That's seven. That's seven days. And again, if you want to know what's changed between yesterday's runs, what the markets had when they closed versus this morning's, this is the difference. So everywhere that you see the green colors, the newest European model run is wetter. And so that includes some sections here and here. Those are kind of some important areas to get this in. The model, again, trended drier for parts of the Carolinas, getting up into Virginia and uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. So that was a drier trend in that region. Next, what about the GFS? So the GFS comes through. This is through Monday. So it's trying to put some moisture down here. But then we go out there to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going to park this again at a week out so we can compare the models. That's the Euro to the GFS, the Euro again to the GFS. Both of them have a similar look on this, but we are waiting to see how this might possibly evolve uh, beyond that. All right. So the next thing, let's go look at the probability maps. What has increased in the 10 day outlook is that area right in through here has gone from a 10% chance of getting an inch of rain to now upwards of a 40 to 60% chance. The models continue to fill it in, but they're doing it earlier. That's the big difference. Now, I may be providing some false hope in my voice because I understand there is going to be a lot of crop damage in this area already. And as many of you know that are corn and soybean farmers, I just circled some very critical and key acres uh, here in the United States. But moisture, anything, starts to help us kind of, you know, heal that, what, you know, these, these long-term issues that have gone, gone on here. And I would like to show you the GFS ensemble. This is, let's go back. I got a, they got a 6Z run in, but I want to show you the 0Z. There we go. This is the 0Z run for the probability of getting an inch of rain. And it is really starting to blow up those bigger storms, again, around the 24th, 25th, 26th. And the thought is these will cascade through the rest of the Corn Belt. So much different look from the GFS, but all along the GFS has been the wetter model out of these. To show you now the model comparison between the CPC's newest update, the uh, ECMWF, and the GFS, this line keeps moving farther east. And the European model's forecast for continued dryness in here, it does keep shrinking. That's going to be a, the most important thing to watch in the next few updates is to see if this does in fact make it through here. Yes, there's a lot of heat coming into Texas. The GFS is always too dry in summer down here across the southeast, but southwest monsoon, no early start for it this year, according to the, the patterns. Now, temperatures. It was a cooler morning around the Great Lakes Basin again today. I got to go out and stand at a swim meet, and I don't know if the kids are going to want to get in the pool at 53 degrees here in about 45 minutes, but um, there is a big change coming in these temperatures, and I'm going to show it to you here. The heat's on in Texas. Storms last night, hailers, a lot of instability. But this goes out into Sunday and a Monday. Watch the trough come into the west. That is high temperatures in the mid-70s in the Central Valley of California on June 19th. I mean, that's something. The ridge then, you remember, the axis of the ridge by Tuesday sets up here. So a lot of 90s for the Corn Belt. 110 down here in parts of South Central Texas. Then we go forward into Wednesday. Another hot one in the Midwest, hot in Texas. But you know this pattern. I've showed it to you. Highly amplified ridge comes in like this, and there's that cutoff low down here, and that's what we get. That's what you see. So this is going out to the 22nd. This will be the first full day of summer, and the 23rd, another hot one in this particular area. But the models continue to evolve the position of the ridge to move over Mexico, and as a result of doing that, line out the jet and the hope is that it comes through like this and punches on through finally and delivers those rains. It is thankfully no longer 12 to 15 days out. It's it's closer in the forecast. And this gets you all the way out there to July the 1st. This is what we're looking at here. Lastly, of course, there is a system in the Atlantic. This is the latest update on it, 70% chance of development. Um, I am also watching, like I told you yesterday, anything to come out of this area to move into the Gulf. But um, one of the things I love about this particular animation from Weather Nerds is, uh, is that it shows the position of the high pressure cell in the background. So you can see the coloring. So that's what these tropical systems orbit around. And if you notice, a lot of the tracks are trying to take it off in this direction. That's because that high watch moves on off back toward like the Azores or moves it back over toward Africa. And this is just problematic for 
you know, a lot of reasons, but the good news is, is it keeps this potential tropical system away from the southeast coast, which is, of course, flooding right now. Um, do notice the models are trying to do something here. Got to keep a close eye on that. Last thing I want to show you is the CPC did give an update yesterday afternoon on Friday. This is their first two weeks of July outlook. And it's important to see that they've no longer called for dryness in this area. And I will tip my cap to the CPC because they've been a, they've been great at picking up on the pattern and they've done they've just done well with it. So we'll take a look at their stuff and, 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 and give it a good look here. Okay, have a good rest of your Saturday. We'll talk again tomorrow. Thanks.